here we go. This is the Skip Bayless Show, episode 40. 40. This is the un undisputed, everything I cannot share with you during the two and a half hour go for the throat debate show known as undisputed. In episode 40, I will tell you why I believe the NFL world just missed the entire point on what Tom Brady has been through this football season. I will tell you how and why I have fallen completely out of love with my two favorite Dallas Cowboys. I will tell you which Halloween horror movie rocked and wrecked my life and which horror movies I can and cannot stomach. And as always, I will answer your questions, including this week. Would I make a better NFL or NBA coach? Good question. And also this week, which movie or TV character do I think acts the most like me? Weird, but good question. But first up, as always, it is not to be skipped. So, last Friday, late in our show, Undisputed, the news broke that Tom Brady and Giselle had, what? Finalized a divorce? S say what? I was so shook up by this bombshell that I immediately went on live national TV on Undisputed and I actually misstated the news. I said they had filed for divorce because I couldn't compute what had just happened. And Shannon Sharp, my big debate partner uh, across the desk, just immediately corrected me, said, no, they have finalized their divorce. Time out. We had just seen and heard another round of insider quotes saying that Giselle had issued a new ultimatum to Tom, quit quit football, or I'm gone. And now on October 28th, the divorce was finalized? That according to a statement released by Tom and another statement released by Giselle. Mind blowing. Trust me on this. When Tom Brady is worth, I don't know, a reported $250 million and Giselle is worth maybe $450 million. And there are two children involved in this equation. There is no such thing as a quickie divorce. No way that on, let's just say October 26th or 27th, Tom called Giselle and, and said, Hey, I, I'm sorry, I just can't quit football right now. And Giselle said, okay, I want a divorce right here, right now. And Tom said, done, no, 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 that did not happen. This had to have been in the works for months, very probably dating back to March 13th, when you might recall, Tom unretired. That's when I believe Giselle surely said, okay, that's it. I want a divorce. And somehow Tom and Giselle successfully hid that fact from the media for, I don't know, six or seven months. Now, remember the 11 days that Tom took off during training camp? Very possibly that time off was required just to meet with lawyers, just to hash out the thousands and thousands of details impacting the millions and millions of dollars on the table. No doubt she had a team of lawyers, no doubt he had his team of lawyers. I went through one divorce in my life. It was early in my career. I had very little to split. And yet that divorce dragged on for weeks. I've had several friends who did have a whole lot to split, go through these messy protracted divorces that went on for as much as a year. Yes, Tom and Giselle both said that the split was amicable, aren't they all? But even amicable can be extremely complicated 
when you own so much and make so much. And, and you, you have to set in contractual stone kid sharing rules, all of which a judge has to carefully review and bless with one rap of the gavel. It's just hard. It's just so taxing and so draining. So the fact is, Tom Brady obviously did not spend the first two months of this football season living apart from Giselle, as was reported, and just going through some sort of trial separation. Nope. They were working on and finalizing a divorce. That's why, by the way, especially when it comes to what's really going on behind closed doors with a celebrity couple, you, you just can't speculate because you just can't know. I, I, think, I see things written about my wife Ernestine and me, and I, I just shake my head, what? Just can't know for sure. Now, step back for just a second from this. Who relies on daily and nightly film study as much as any quarterback who ever buckled a chin strap. The GOAT, number 12, Tom Brady. The sixth rounder who ran the ugliest 40 yard dash in the history of the combine, obviously relies on his football genius as much as he does on his arm. But that genius has to be fed daily and nightly, has to be fueled by intensely focused dedication to breaking down tape. Why did my partner Shannon Sharp hang him up at age 35? Yeah, his body was starting to betray him, but he just got sick and tired of all the meetings and all the endless tedious film study. And I can't blame him. It happens to almost all of them. But Tom, Tom Brady still loves and lives for sitting for hours, often by himself, trying to decipher a defense, trying to identify the weakness he can exploit in a defense. It's a game within the game to him. He's trying to solve the puzzle that he gets presented week after week. I'll never forget the Josh McDaniel story that he told when he was Tom's coordinator in New England. Tom called him late one night, just out of his mind with excitement. I found it. Tom was at home studying tape of the Cincinnati Bengals in a preseason game two years before this game that was about to upcome. And Josh McDaniels says he just shook his head and said, the guy is a maniac when it comes to film study because he lives for it. So help me out here. How much film studying, game planning time over the last two months was lost to strategizing with lawyers who were constantly negotiating with her lawyers. Trust me, there's no way Tom Brady has been able to spend the same amount of quality time on football. I I'm talking about locked in, all in, clear-minded, mentally fresh, focus on football. No way. Now, I see zero decline in Brady's arm talent, in his velocity or his deep range. Four or five times a game in the eight we've seen him play so far, he'll make a throw at 45 with the same zing he had at 25. But he'll also make four or five throws that make you say, huh, what was that? That's a reason the Bucks have fallen to three and five. And yes, Tom Brady has gotten more frustrated than usual. He's throwing his tablets on the sideline. He's throwing fits on the field after a play fails. He knows he's not as prepared to play football as he always has been. And obviously he's even quicker to anger than he used to be. And obviously, it's because his family situation has threatened, if not undercut, his ability to dominate football games. His domination comes in preparation. 
I've always called him Psycho Tom, the crazy competitor him, his alter ego has reared its ugly head since, I don't know, his third or fourth year in New England. I love that side of Tom Brady. That's the side that has rocket fueled 10 Super Bowl appearances and seven rings. And by the way, two Super Bowls that Brady's defense cost him. But lately, we haven't seen just psycho Tom. We've seen this new Tom. We've seen frustrated, drained, distracted Tom Brady. I believe all that is about to change now that the divorce is shockingly final at mid-season. Look, much of this season has not been Tom Brady's fault. I, I think anybody with half a brain can see that. You can blame a big part of this three and five season on the injury gods who just said to Tom Brady, not this year, Tom, not meant to be. Now the Bucks defense is decimated with injuries. Wide receiver core has been decimated and riddled all season. Tom personally recruited Julio Jones via IG to be his new deep threat and Julio had one flash at Dallas in that opener, 148-yard bomb that he caught, and he's been hurt ever since. There's no Gronk. There's obviously no more AB. There's no Gio Bernard, who's on IR. Chris Godwin still hasn't regained his burst after ACL reconstruction. Brady has two new offensive linemen who have not remotely been able to live up and replace two pro bowlers at guard and center. It just has not been the same. These aren't excuses. I'm just spitting facts. Tom Brady hasn't nearly had the supporting cast this year that he had his first two years in Tampa. But the biggest negative that didn't hit me between the eyes until last Friday, October 28th, was that Tom Brady spent the first two months of this football season trying to finalize a high-profile, high-stakes, celebrity couple divorce. I had no idea. The deed is done? Tom and Giselle obviously had agreed on getting a divorce several months ago. So for Tom, this wasn't so much about heartbreak in the last couple of months as it's been about mind ache, about time consuming, lawyer distractions, discussions, cut into his football focus. I believe Tom Brady will be much sharper on the football field, much better prepared starting now. Now the schedule as we look down the road at it, it's unrelenting. Rams on Sunday, obviously at Tampa, then it's on to Cleveland, which has suddenly found itself. Then it's the division nemesis that New Orleans has been to Tom. Then it's at San Francisco, yikes. Then it's Cincinnati, probably with Jamar Chase back, that in Tampa, then it's at Arizona before finishing with two winnable division games, Carolina, and then at suddenly resurgent Atlanta. Now, I picked Brady's Bucks to win it all this year, to win the Super Bowl, and never flip, skip, as they've called me for years. We'll stick with that pick. Impossible as it seems as we speak. Obviously, the Bucks will have to get much healthier. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. It wouldn't hurt if Gronk suddenly came out of retirement to save his boy Tommy. But obviously, all the Bucks need to do is win the worst division in football, the NFC going south. And that way the Bucks would get a home playoff game. But the point is, now Tom Brady is free to obsess with football again. And speaking of predictions, I, I predicted twice in earlier podcasts that I did for you that if Giselle did force Tom's hand, me or football, Tom would choose football, and he just did. Maybe that's way too simplistic. 
maybe there's a whole lot going on behind the scenes we don't know. Maybe they've just grown apart. Who knows? But I think it did come down to Giselle wanting a little more attention from Tom and Tom feeling he had to pay full attention to football. I've said I can relate to Tom Brady only on one small level, on my little level, on my first date with my wife, Ernestine, that was 17 years ago. I told her if this goes any place, anywhere, any way, I said, you will always be number two to my career, which is my life, what I was born to do. This is on the first day, we're eating a slice of pizza on First Avenue in New York City in Manhattan. She now likes to say, well, at least she became a 1A to my career. She has. She's become a vital part of my life. But as I've said, if at any point she'd gotten tired of me, all the prepping I do like a maniac every weeknight, watching every game that's ever played, getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning, pouring every ounce of my being into every live minute of undisputed. If at any point Ernestine had said, I'm sorry, I need you to stop and spend more time with me and live a normal life. If she had said that to me, I would have said, trust me, I would have said, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just going to have to go on without you. I declared myself on the first date. I love Ernestine more than I can express to you. I love having her in my life, but only if she doesn't threaten what I live for. Shannon Sharp says Tom Brady was selfish for unretiring, and I say, no, 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 no. He simply came to the realization that nothing else in his life will ever make him as happy as football does. And by the way, he knew full well he was playing greater than ever at age 44. Think about that, playing greater than ever. NFL players off last season, his 44-year-old season, voted him the best player in the National Football League. Think about that, the best. It wasn't career achievement, it was just off last football season. Pro football focus graded him last football season, the best quarterback during the regular season. So why exactly would you retire now? Just for Giselle and the kids? Tom's been giving them way more time than he ever did before during every off season, almost to a fault. And obviously he's been trying the best he can to give Giselle and the kids all he can give them during a football season. So now, depending on how this season plays out, I will not be at all surprised if Tom Brady plays at least one more season, at least one more. Maybe it'll depend on how this one plays out. Maybe he'll just look at this one as the divorce season when everybody got hurt. Maybe it'll just be the one you write off and you go forward. I'm, I'm sure Tom now looks back at the first two months of this season and he's embarrassed by how little time he was able to dedicate to preparing for football games. But now his mind is clear. Now he can be Tom Brady again. Now, I believe, you'll have Tom Brady to love or hate for maybe even a couple of more seasons after this one. Let's get to your question, shall we? We got Van from Ohio who asks, do you think you'd make a better NFL or NBA coach? Hmm, intriguing question. I would make a better NFL general manager. I believe I have demonstrated over almost 20 years on live national TV, a pretty good eye and instinct for which college players can play pro football. And I believe 
I would be better than many current team builders at drafting and trading pro football players. Now, if I had to choose, I think I'd be a little better football than basketball coach because I think I'd be commanding 50-odd football players instead of trying to babysit a couple of D's, excuse me, diva superstars in basketball, which is what it ultimately comes down to. But it's funny. Basketball was my first love as a kid, and yet baseball was the game I played by far the best. But once I left Vanderbilt for a career in sports media, I immediately gravitated to football. The game I only played up through eighth grade when I was the quarterback for a team filled with mostly ninth graders called the Utility Tower Toppers. That was our name. Utility Towers sponsored us. The Tower Toppers. We won every game that last year I played and wound up in the city finals, played under lights in what must have been zero degree wind chill at Northeast High School football field. We lost that game 42 to nothing. I will never forget it. It's like it was yesterday. We lost 42 to nothing to Daryl Porter's Southside Bears. You can look him up. I've mentioned him before. Daryl Porter went on to be World Series MVP. He was an all-star catcher for the Kansas City Royals and also played for the St. Louis Cardinals, my favorite team. So that was the last football game I ever played. I quit football to concentrate on basketball, but I was blessed to immediately start learning pro football from Don Shula, and then the greatest coach ever, Bill Walsh, and then the great Tom Landry, and then the great Jimmy Johnson, and there was Dave Wanstead, and there was North Turner, and I could go on and on. I know football even better than I do basketball at the pro level. I think I have a pretty good feel for the National Football League. Another question from the audience from Jason from Dallas. Does your routine change when the Cowboys have a bye week? Jason. Absolutely not. The show must go on two and a half hours a day, five days a week. Now, I will miss the Dallas Cowboys on Monday's show. But trust me on this, because they remain America's most interesting team and by far America's most watched football team. We do Cowboy topics every day, even during a bye week. That's because Ringmaster Jerry says or does something highly debatable nearly every single day. Now, maybe Super Salesman Jerry is selling ice to us Eskimos. Maybe he's just promoting the world's most valuable sports franchise. Think about that. The world's most valuable sports franchise, the Dallas Cowboys. Maybe he's promoting it by conning us with fake controversy. Maybe it's all an act. But what a captivating act it is. And now to demonstrate my point, even though my Dallas Cowboys are off this week, I'm about to be on my Cowboys. Allow me to get my bye week fix right here, right now. So, since I left the ESPN for Fox, for FS1, I've been a part of three national TV commercials, all promoting Undisputed and all built around my love for my Dallas Cowboys. First one came in 2016. That was the all-time great Morris Chestnut movie theater commercial. Maybe you remember it. If not, please look it up on YouTube. Please watch it. It's a classic, not because of me, because of Morris, the great Morris Chestnut. So up on the screen, 
Morris, while defusing a bomb, suddenly breaks the fourth wall and looks out into the theater and spies me and starts arguing with me, six, eight rows up in the theater, about whether the Cowboys are going to the Super Bowl because Morris is a huge Eagles fan, born and raised. Obviously, in the commercial, he forgets what he's doing and he blows up. And I turn and say to the guy behind me, horrible clock management. Then in 2017, my man Shannon Sharp and I shot a commercial built around my love for Dak Prescott, who as a rookie replacing the injured Tony Romo had lifted my Cowboys shockingly to 13 and three in the number one seed in the NFC. That commercial, regrettably, never aired because Zeke got suspended, Dak fell on his face, or should I say face mask, and a whole lot of time and a whole lot of money was wasted on my Dak-loving commercial. It just didn't work. Then in 2019, you might remember, Shannon and I shot a Better Come Prepared commercial as we're racing early in the morning to be each other to the studio. Of course, I win. But in the opening shot of that commercial, as my alarm goes off, I jump out of bed <laughs> already wearing my workout clothes. And on my nightstand, you can see in plain sight a picture of Ezekiel Elliott, my man, Zeke. Zeke's mom loved that commercial so much that she tried to come in and sit with us live in studio and undisputed. And I forget why it didn't work out, but it didn't quite, but she loved the commercial and probably doesn't love what I've been saying about Zeke, which I'm about to get to. Now I'm here to tell you that I'm not really your normal, typical type of fan. For many fans that I've known, when they fall in football love with a player, that player becomes their all-time favorite and it's till death do them part. I guess I'm a little more cold-blooded when it comes to my favorite Cowboys, a little more demanding. I, I require that you keep earning my love. Dak and Zeke have not. My all-time favorite Dallas Cowboy, Roger Staubach, never let me down. Well, he did one time. I've mentioned it here on the podcast. Maybe I'll go into greater detail later. That's when I played him after he'd retired in a basketball game featuring Cliff Harris. But that's another story. I'm just talking as the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, Roger never let me down. Whew. Dak and Zeke have all too often. First Dak. I'm definitely not done with Dak. In fact, as you might know, I'm picking the Dallas Cowboys, as I did before the season, to get all the way to their first NFC Championship game in 27 years because in large part of Dak Prescott. I believe he's got a deep playoff run in him. But it's now time to prove that. More than ever, it's time to prove that. Dak has let me down way too many times for me to still be unconditionally sold on Dak after he stunk it up on opening night at home against the Goat and the Bucks, He fell to six and six in his last 12 games and 18 and 18 in his last 36. Too many stinkers, too many what was that's, too many national TV commercials, too much money, I thought, paid to him by Jerry Jones who caved and got taken to the cleaners and the bank. Too much jealousy from Dak now of Micah Parsons, the new face of the franchise. 
last season, as you recall, Dak stunk against the Broncos. He stunk at Kansas City. He stunk against Las Vegas on Thanksgiving. Stunk against Kyler and really stunk against the 49ers in a home playoff game. That's why I was so happy that Cooper Rush just fell out of the sky right into our laps. Cooper Rush did what Dak Prescott has not been able to do consistently, and that's make the big little throws that consistently won games. Obviously, he wasn't as spectacular as Dak, but Cooper Rush saved our season. He won so many high degree of difficulty games starting obviously a year ago with that Sunday night game at Minnesota and this year versus Cincinnati when the Bengals were healthy and then at the Rams. I mean, Cooper Rush beat both the Super Bowl teams from last year. He beat the Giants at the Giants and he beat our arch rival Washington handily, albeit at home. And he brought the Cowboys back to only 2017 down early in the fourth quarter at Philadelphia against that team and that crowd. He put our defense in position to win that football game. And that defense could not stop Jalen Hurts on three consecutive third downs. So, yeah, Dak is now back in the saddle and all is right in the Cowboy world. Isn't it? Let's see, Dak just benefited from the two easiest games back-to-back -back at home on anybody's schedule that you'll be able to find in the National Football League for the entire season. Back-to-back -back games. Gimmies, Lions, and Bears. Dangerous offenses, but I got a defense. Dangerous offenses, but lousy defenses. Yet, horrifyingly, the Lions were one yard away early in the fourth quarter of going ahead 13 to 10. Think about that. Dak's offense has scored only 10 against the Lions early in the fourth quarter. Shamefully scary. But he was rusty. So here came the Bears, who just traded away their best defensive player, Robert Quinn, former Cowboy. And Dak put on a show. Best game I've seen him play since opening Thursday night of a season ago at GOAT when he threw a party but lost on a walk-off field goal to said GOAT. This past Sunday against the Bears, Dak had a QBR of 94, scale 0 to 100. That was the highest QBR of any quarterback that NFL weekend or week. And I'm thinking, go Dak, go. Throw Dak, throw. And then in the end, no Dak, no. Hold the phone, stop the presses. The truth is, Dak's 2022 Dallas Cowboys season doesn't start until a week from Sunday at Green Bay. Aaron Rodgers has owned my Cowboys. Now Aaron's Packers are ownable. So go up there and own that game, Dak Prescott, like you did as a rookie when you went up to the frozen tundra. Go beat the Vikings the following week at Minnesota. Cowboy backup quarterback Andy Dalton did it two years ago. Cowboy backup quarterback Cooper Rush did it last year. Show me, Dak. Then, Dak, please beat the Giants on Thanksgiving. Cooper Rush beat them up at their place on Monday night. Finally, Dak, wreak revenge on those Eagles on Christmas Eve at Jerry World. Give me an early Christmas present that I deserve. Now, that would be a Cooper shush performance. Cooper, shush. It's time, Dak. Show me. Win back my love and my trust. NFC Championship game or bust. Now, Zeke. I'm just afraid my man Zeke is a lost cause. Forgive me, Mama Zeke. Forgive me. I'm just telling the truth. Last Sunday at Jerry World, I saw the future, and the future wears number 20, not number 21. I saw Tony Pollard break TD runs of 18 and 7, and then 54 to the house. I saw a thoroughbred to Zeke's plow horse. I saw voltage. I saw explosion. I saw breakaway lightning. 
the kind I haven't seen since really Zeke's rookie year. I saw a different. I saw an NFC Championship game. Now, Zeke, as you know, did lead the league in yards per game each of his first three Cowboy seasons. But every year since, down, 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 down. I am so tired of watching Dallas Cowboy teams over the last three years attempt to establish the run with Ezekiel Elliott trying to run through brick walls. Zeke for one yard. Zeke for none, Zeke for two, Zeke for minus one, Zeke for zero. Cooper Rush was stuck with Zeke. Zeke did not play last Sunday as Dak's offense exploded for 42 points. Of course, Micah Barsons gave them the other seven on that fumble return. But how much did Dak benefit from 131 yards and three touchdowns from Tony Pollard? As Dak said after the game, we call it and he hauls it. Does he ever haul you know what? Now, I realize how much this team in this locker room still believes in Zeke's warrior spirit. He will try to run through brick walls. He will play hurt. Torn knee ligaments, sprained knee ligaments, Yep, he, he will try with all his might to wear down a defense. If you give him 25 carries, he'll bang away. He will blow up blitzers. Best blitz pickup, blow up of any back in football. He has become, shockingly to me, a respected veteran leader of that football team. But for Jerry Jones to say, we still go as Zeke goes, is just plain fiction and plain wrong just plain damaging to the psyche of this football team. This offense will go as far as Tony Pollard carries it. Yet, the way Jerry Jones speaks, is it's as if TP still just stands for toilet paper. Jerry loves Zeke like a son. Jerry has you could say he's, he's actually fathered Zeke through some tough times off the field. I'm sure Jerry sees some of his once wayward self in Zeke and feels like a proud papa, thinks he's helped Zeke beat some of those demons, if not all of them. But Jerry, it is time. It's time to officially make Zeke the backup back. It's, it's time to put the ball in Tony Pollard's hands, I don't know, 25 times a game. Remember, he was, in large part, a slot receiver in college at Memphis. He can catch it. He can fly with it. He can make a miss. All the things Zeke no longer does, God bless his soul. It's time, Jerry. Tony Pollard will be a free agent after this season. You might as well at least max him out while you, you have him under his rookie contract. Jerry, you added no one on offense at the trade deadline. So add a Pro Bowl running back to the starting lineup. Add Tony Pollard. It's right there under your nose. Yeah, Zeke got paid. He held out three years ago in combo, excuse me, in Cabo. You folded, you buckled, you paid him. You paid him for what he had done. But for the last three years, he hasn't remotely lived up to being the NFL's highest paid running back. Jerry, it's time to swallow your pride. Jerry, it's time for you to admit you made a mistake. You overpaid Zeke dramatically. You got to let it go. You've got to give up on Ezekiel Elliott. And Zeke, to you, I'm sorry, but it is now time for Tony Pollard to TP the league. Only Tony Pollard can make this offense go the way it should go, the way it should be able to almost live up to a defense. Obviously, I say again and again, this team ultimately would go only as far as Micah and the Marauders carry this team. But... Can you imagine what Cooper Rush might have done if Tony Pollard had been his featured back? 
It is time to pass the, the torch, Jerry, while using that torch to light a new make or break fire under the seat occupied by Dak Prescott. Back to your question, Niles from Buffalo, New York. Do you ever read your debate answers off a teleprompter? Niles, that's like asking me if Josh Allen needs Ken Dorsey, his coordinator, to tell him in his ear which receiver to throw to as he's dropping back to pass. No, 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 no. I have never ever used a teleprompter. I might glance down at my notes to just remember a stat or a key point, but I am mostly responding to what Shannon Sharp says. So it would be virtually impossible to script an answer because I really have no idea what's about to come out of Shannon's mouth on live national TV. I, I think I know that Shannon is a pro or a con on a topic, a yes or a no, but sometimes that changes on the fly. Shannon can go loose cannon. He can hit me right between the eyes with a deep voiced, high decibel broadside, right between the eyes. Talk about think fast. So no, I do not have the time to write out and then type in answers on a teleprompter, nor do I have the need. I have carefully plotted out and written down, if not scribbled down, my answers or just parts of, fragments of, just to help me memorize them. I have definitely strategized, if he goes here, then I'll go here and he'll be trapped. But undisputed is so unrehearsed, so unscripted, and I'd like to think so unrivaled as a debate show. Luis from Los Angeles asks, what movie or TV character acts the most like Skip Bayless? Huh. This question shook me and I thought, I'm not sure. Maybe I should ask my wife Ernestine and her answer shook me even more. She just blurted right back at me, you're the Terminator. You're Schwarzenegger. You never stop. You just keep going and going and going, said my wife, Ernestine. Hmm. Okay. So then I thought about it. And I'll admit, I actually identify with Kevin Costner's character in Yellowstone which, by the way, does return November 13th with season, excuse me, season five on Paramount. John Dutton is the patriarch of the largest ranch in the United States. He has a big soft heart for those he loves, but he has no mercy for those who don't love or respect him. Now, if somebody challenges me, I'm obviously not going to have them killed, as John Dutton does. He can be one bad MF. But I am going to fight with all my might in on-air debates, and I am going to prevail. That's John Dutton. So John Dutton gets all shot up, winds up in the hospital, think he's about gone, then he tears off his IV. He walks right out of the hospital long before he's supposed to. And I sit back and think, yep, that's me. Now, speaking of movies, because it was the Halloween season, Ernestine and I decided to try something scary, as we always do. Something on Netflix, maybe? The Watcher had created significant buzz. We had seen a lot of it. Why not? 
We like Bobby Cannavale. We like Naomi Watts. There's even Mia Farrow. There was even Michael Norrie, who once upon a time Ernestine actually dated back in his flash dance days, probably way before your time. But we said, yeah, this is a couple of Saturday nights ago. Let's give it a shot. We watched the first three episodes, and the setup and the buildup were sensational. We were hooked. Family moves out of Manhattan into their suburban New Jersey dream home. And they start getting threatening letters from the watcher. Potential highly suspicious suspects were coming out of the bushes and out of the woodwork. It gets scarier and scarier. But then, later in episode three, all of a sudden, the Watcher careens into sheer horror, the kind I cannot stomach, with the psycho killing of a family who had lived in said house. I had a little trouble going to sleep that night. And Ernestine and I agreed we would not watch any more of The Watcher. Then again, I couldn't unwatch The Watcher. And the more I thought about it, by last Saturday night, I, I finally said, hey, I just need to know who done it. So we sucked it up. She mostly closed her eyes. And we watched the final four episodes of, wait a second, season one? We were shocked when we realized that, wait, how can there be a season two? Well, there shouldn't be. The last four episodes go nowhere slowly. The Watcher is all dressed up with no place to go. It goes from edge of seat to edge of toilet seat. It is not scary. It is not tense. It's not much of anything but mind-numbingly silly and frustrating. In the end, the story has more holes in it than some horror movie maggot-eaten corpse. W wait, w what about that? No, no, wait, w what about that? Loose ends are everywhere. We're, we're tripping over loose ends. What? Now, now wait, everybody's a red herring? We read on the internet, fans of The Watcher were outraged at the end of season one, and I don't blame them. We couldn't even muster up outrage that it was so bad. Who done it? Who knows? So late Saturday night, as I thought about horror movies, I flashed back to the early flashpoint of my movie watching life. When I was in ninth grade in Oklahoma City, I was going out with or going steady with or whatever it was at that point in my life with a girl who would become my first wife named Liz. First Saturday night I ever went over to her, ha her house. We sat in her living room on the couch and we watched Alfred Hitchcock's The Rear Window. Maybe you know it. It's an all-time great thriller, not a horror movie, just a thriller starring the great Jimmy Stewart and the too gorgeous to be true Grace Kelly. So, we enjoyed that so much that five months later, when I had a chance to take Liz to another Hitchcock classic, I thought, well, why not? This one was called Psycho. And I had no idea what I was getting into. Some lists rank Psycho as the number one horror movie of all time, number one of all time, Psycho. But Psycho is just the kind of horror movie my psyche cannot take. I, I don't know. There's just something about my imagination is just too vivid. I just feel way too intensely. I way too quickly care about those people up on screen. And for me, Psycho is just too real. 
Psycho is about sick, demented, knife-wielding, blood-spilling, violence inflicted by ultimate psycho Norman Bates on innocent people at a motel, the Bates Motel. I'm getting creeps just talking about it. The shower scene with the screeching music. Eek, eek, eek. The blood swirling slowly down the drain. Then the quote-unquote mother reveal at the end. I, I was rocked and shocked and wrecked. For the next three nights, trust me, I could not sleep even with the lights on. I tried to fall asleep, but the lights were staying on. My nerves were raw and jangled. I flinched at the slightest little provocation. Psycho upset me at the deepest levels of my soul and psyche. And to this day, I have never watched a single minute of it again, even when it's right there for me on cable. I just make sign of the cross and hit the down arrow. So when it comes to horror movies, here's what I can and cannot watch. I, I can watch and enjoy immensely anything vampire. I've watched hundreds of vampire movies. Love them. Anything Frankenstein, anything werewolf, anything zombies, great with it. Because they're not real to me. Dracula from Bela Lugosi to Bram Stoker to Clay's Bang in the recent Dracula series Ernestine and I watched and loved. Ernestine did not love it, but, but I even loved the extremely dark Let Me In with the young Chloe Grace Moretz as the vampire. Loved it. It's a remake of Swedish movie that's, I think, on cable now. I think I saw it the other day. I still get a big kick out of the original Halloween, 1978 Halloween. Jamie Lee Curtis, damsel in distress babysitter. It's, it's just scary fun to me. It, it, never, it never creams over the edge into, like, mindless gore to me. We've watched it many Halloweens because it's just scary fun. I'm, I'm fine with anything Stephen King, even The Shining, creepy as it is, red rum. I, I can't say I loved it, but I liked it, maybe because of Jack Nicholson. But Saw, I will never see Saw, never ever. And when it comes to anything devil worship or demonic possession, no, thank you. Never saw The Exorcist. Never saw Rosemary's Baby. I will not. I, I just don't believe in inviting any of that into my consciousness. So, anything monsters, no problem. Godzilla, alien. It's just make-believe to me. Psycho, way too real. Even the great Get Out, it was a sensational thriller with just a hint of tongue-in-cheek that saved it from Psycho. Anything Jordan Peele, get me in. But in the end, the truth is, I just don't like to be scared. Getting shocked out of my wits does not entertain me. For me, it's just a little sick to seek that kind of shock. I'll risk it every so often if I think the movie is worth it just because of the creative art involved. That rises above the shock factor. And by the way, similarly, I, I have no use for what I call vomit rides at amusement parks. It's the same syndrome to me. Wait, I, I want to go sit on a roller coaster or wh whatever these vomit rides are. And I, I want my head and, and my stomach to be whirled like I'm in a dryer in, until I want to puke. That's fun. I, I don't get it. But, but I don't get shock horror, which leads to my final thought. 
When, when I was a kid, I wasn't really into Halloween. I was a weird kid. I, did, I didn't mind going to church, actually. I didn't mind it at all. I chose to do it. And I kind of liked it. But on Halloween, I'd look around and I'd think, wait a second. The parents are encouraging the kids. This is back in the day. They're encouraging their kids to dress up like devils and witches. Because that was really about all we had at that point. You sort of had any kind of ghost or ghoul, but it was mostly devils and witch costumes. What? And, and you're going to celebrate the dark side. You're going to celebrate evil by going from house to house, knocking on strangers' doors, demanding candy, or else your house will be egged. What? It, it's really not trick or treat. It, it should be called treat or trick, right? It's treat or trick. At least that was the custom of the day. And I'm thinking as a kid, this is a national holiday? It, it's more like a sign the apocalypse is upon us. I, I love this country as much as anybody loves this country, but some of our traditions, some of our customs just make me shake my head. I mean, even the 4th of July, so we celebrate winning a war for our country's independence by allowing our kids, especially back in the day, to go out in the backyard and light tiny bombs that they hold in their hands, which can blow their fingers off. I still have a scar right here across my forefinger where I held on to what was called a black cat firecracker. I held on just a little too long as the fuse went a little faster down to the gunpowder than I thought, and it blew up in my hand. Tiny bombs, that's how we celebrate our country's independence with our children. But I do appreciate that it seems like Halloween has evolved into as much an adult's holiday as a kid's. And I love the fact that adults don't dress up as devils and goblins and witches as much as they go to parties to celebrate being somebody other than themselves. I love that. I talk to so many friends who have so much fun with that. I don't, but I get it. And even in the last couple of days, I talked to friends with kids and they said their kids just love Halloween. And I love that they love it. It's become bigger and bigger, but maybe just as a celebration instead of a celebration of the dark side. It's a celebration of Disney characters, cartoon characters that they love. I love that. I think we have evolved healthily away from what Halloween used to be. And now that I've said all that, and now that I've faced up to my fear of psycho, now that I've let it creep back into the darkest recesses of my psyche, you know and I know what's about to happen to me. Tonight, I will sleep with the lights on. That's it for episode 40. Thank you for listening and or watching. Thanks to Jonathan Berger and his all pro team for making this show go. Thanks to Tyler Korn for producing. Remember, Undisputed, 9.30 to noon every weekday, The Skip Bayless Show.